Next up, we have two speakers, Jeff Freed of InterSystems and Sean Smith of Data Robot. Jeff Freed, Director of Product Management for InterSystems, is a longstanding data management nerd and particularly passionate about helping people create powerful data-driven applications. Prior to joining InterSystems, Jeff was CTO of BA Insight and ran product management for Fast Search and Transfer and for Microsoft. He has extensive experience in data management, text analytics, enterprise search, machine learning, and interoperability. Jeff is a frequent speaker and writer in the industry, holds 15 patents, and has authored more than 50 technical papers and co-authored three technical books. Sean Smith is a director of success at Data Robot, where he supports customers' development of actionable intelligence with automated machine learning. Sean has held multiple positions in advanced analytics and machine learning with some of today's largest technology companies and is a contributing author to Towards AI, one of the top artificial intelligence publications on Medium. Please join me in welcoming them both to the stage. Thank you and hello. Uh, I'm Jeff Freed. Sean Smith. And you notice that we look a, a lot like our pictures. Uh, and you've joined a, a session really that provides a practical path to machine learning success, specifically for financial services, because this is AI for finance. Uh, Sean and I are partners. InterSystems and Data Robot have partnered together really because data, which is the foundation of everything that InterSystems does, we call it clean data, is the fuel for machine learning. And that's the foundation of everything that Data Robot does. They have a premier, uh, excellent uh, tool set, as well as tons of experience in machine learning specifically. And what we both noticed as we were comparing notes for this session is that the promise of machine learning has not been uh, realized in financial services as much as in some of the other industries we serve. Uh, Gartner talks about a $3.9 trillion uh, business value for machine learning next year. And $200 billion in banking and securities is a lot but it's about five times less proportionately than other verticals. Uh, I do a lot of work as well as in financial services, in healthcare, in government, in manufacturing. And the question is why? It's not through lack of applications. In fact, there's lots of great success stories and applications inside financial services firms everywhere you look. Uh, the slide shows just, just a few. Uh, there's many high value applications in, in this kind of technology. So it's not because of the lack of promise. It's not because of the lack of application areas. It's really about successful adoption. We've run through and done some surveys based upon what challenges are out there in that, in that adoption cycle. And we found that building models, 96% of uh, people that we surveyed experienced problems with that development of those models. And historically, this was a very manual process. So you can imagine it being very challenging. And then once you actually got a model to be able to take that and actually deploy it into a business process, 90% of the the surveys that we went through essentially cited obstacles and being able to get a model into production and use it for a tactical business process. And then on, on the other side of that, being able to monitor their models and the assets to be able to, once you put a model into production, understand if it's drifting away from where it actually started uh, to be able to use that. 1% uh, essentially have, has been able to do that. Yeah, this is a pretty dismal picture if you think about this in terms of the obstacles on this road. Uh, and we will characterize it really as three 
uh, challenges that a lot of companies face. Uh, the first is a skills shortage. Uh, the data scientists are still uh, one of the hottest job titles, uh, but they're hard to find, hard to train. And anything that you can do to provide uh, things that turbocharge or accelerate the data scientists you have or make it easy for people to ramp up is highly valuable. The second is the data challenges. Uh, there's a varying statistics depending on how you look at it, but uh, IDC had a survey last year that said 90% uh, of data scientists' time is spent in data wrangling. And I'd claim that the other 10% is spent complaining about data wrangling, that having data in good shape, not perfect, you don't need perfect data to do machine learning, but you do need to have uh, decent data in place. Uh, and that's a lot of work. And then the th third area is really about making the jump from having a model in the lab, if you will, to using it in production. So th these are three big challenges. And I'll say that a lot of this also relates to a mindset. Um, if you start to get into machine learning, you'll often read about the math and the types of models and the types of algorithms. And it's, it is, uh, in some ways, just math uh, that is behind this, but it can look very, very daunting when in fact it's relatively simple at a conceptual level. It's just different than the way that you may be used to doing software, which traditionally uh, developers spend their time creating algorithms and creating a program and then that program is combined with data to provide an output, where machine learning sort of turns that on its head. And you're not creating an algorithm. You're feeding data properly into a machine that then selects the appropriate model. And you're giving it a family of, of things, but you're basically creating a program out of this. And it's, uh, I, I find this a useful mentality when you're looking at, uh, at the difference, uh, because data is not perfect and the output are training examples. This is not a deterministic process. So the kind of things you may be used to in regression testing with QA being completely repeatable don't apply. And because real world data may change. You have to be watching how things happen in production, what's called uh, model ops in, in, uh, in some kinds of jargon. So the mentality is one difference to think about machine learning just a little bit differently than you may be used to in your software development life cycle. The other element is to really find the right problems. Many organizations are on a, uh, a growth path and there are different levels of maturity, maturity. So just like any other new technology, you wanna get some success under your belt, get some uh, projects that are early wins and build from there. And uh, I, really heartily recommend this kind of portfolio look, you'll find a whole spectrum of potential applications within your organization. But then you want to look at which are the uh, best ones to start. Uh, and then not try to boil the ocean, just try to solve that problem and go from there, uh, rinse and repeat and build muscle in this discipline, if you will. Now, 
both InterSystems and Data Robot have some very powerful offerings to accelerate this process and remove some of the obstacles we talked about. And Sharon and I will talk about that respectively. For InterSystems, one of the, uh, uh, the key things is to bring machine learning to where the data is. And we have a facility called Integrated ML that's built into our data platform so that, first of all, the data, the production data is in place and you're using that directly. It solves a lot of the governance issues you may run into with respect to data, permissions, uh, duplication, et cetera. But it also makes it much easier to move into production once you have a model well-trained. The other aspect of this around skill shortage is that uh, we work a lot with application developers and the lingua franca is really SQL. So we've created a facility that allows you to invoke the best of AutoML, such as Data Robot, through SQL statements. If you know SQL, you can use this machinery. And I, I wouldn't advocate building a self-driving car without expertise, but this gets you started and gets you connected in to an environment like this, where on the data side, you're working with SQL directly in data, just like any other application. And on the machine learning side, Data Robot has a very powerful and easy to use studio. So you can look, there's transparency of the models, there's a built-in monitoring of things in production. And data scientists can be extremely productive on the right, working with application developers on the left without the kind of uh, moats between the disciplines that you often have in these projects. So in the spirit of uh, continuing our practical approach here, we wanted to take a little bit of a step back and describe kind of the, the analytical maturity that organizations go through. Now, most of you probably have seen this diagram before it came out in 1998, Gartner put it out as a way to describe essentially the analytical maturity levels at an organization. It starts from the left-hand side, it goes up with descriptive analytics, what happened to diagnostics analytics, why things happen to predictive analytics, what will happen, and then last but not least, if we can understand what will happen, we wanna do something about it, so prescriptive analytics. And so this path, essentially over the course of an organization, we've typically acquired different pieces of technology to be able to utilize and, and do these specific analytics. It's a little bit different from how you and I think, and, and I'll relate it back to if you're driving down the street, and ahead of you, you see some brake lights and a couple of cars, you might wonder if it's an accident. You go from the descriptive, what happened, to, well, why did it happen? It might be snowing out, to the predictive, well, if it's snowing out and they rear-ended each other and I don't slow down, I'm going to wind up in the same situation and you ultimately prescribe to slow yourself down. That, what we do individually, is incredibly difficult to do across an organization. The reason being is that it's not so seamless. You can think about it in the same context as driving down the street with your team and one person gets the steering wheel and one person gets the gas pedal and one person gets the blinker and someone else is actually able to look and tell you where to go. Uh, the goal here is to be able to make this seamless and we've been able to do that. So you have details from transactional systems and reports. You put those up into business intelligence tools and dashboards. You wanna take that and be able to predict what can happen next? And Data Robot has an automated and transparent process to be able to do this, identify opportunities, model and validate that data, be able to deploy it and adopt it as a business. And essentially at the top here, you can see distributing that data back to a point of influence. And typically that goes back to our transactional, system, transactional systems to flag things, or it goes back to our reports to alert it to someone. 
So the question is, how does this help you? What are key models for you? So there's traditionally two specific ways that people start with machine learning. They either start with, as you can see here on the left, data or an idea. Data is typically kind of the latter. The ideas are the ones that drive forward. And so we wanted to illustrate that with a bit of an example um, and how to translate that scenario into something that a machine can learn from. So we brought up this example of having challenges with stolen credit cards and fraudulent online transactions. And now you may understand this from being at the bank or you may a financial institution or you may understand this from your personal uh, accounts to be able to see it. And so to be able to have a machine learn from your data, you need to frame your use case into one of five very specific questions. And you can see those appearing on the screen here. The first one is essentially binary. It's a yes or no question. And in our example, we can say, is this transaction fraud, yes or no? The second one is a multi-class example, things like low, medium, or high. Maybe we can ask what the customer's risk level is. The third one is numeric regression, and that's a number per situation. So how many fraudulent per customer? And the last two have to do with time series. People typically like uh, looking at the stock market charts over time and, and things like time series as far as a number over time. So how many fraudulent over time? And last but not least, the time series binary one, which is probably the most complicated only in the case of how you have to organize the data. So when will this customer have a fraudulent transaction over time? And if you can take your data and your business question and frame it into one of these five specific areas, DataRobot will be able to give you a model. It will be able to tell you the accuracy of that model. It will be able to tell you what's driving the model and it'll also be able to help you actually predict out on an individual record basis, exact details for everything that you're asking. So we wanted to highlight one really good example. And I picked an example that's, that's kind of the, the middle of the road. So in, in finance right now, we have a whole bunch of startup uh, organizations, fintechs that are coming to market. They're very specific, hyper-focused on particular use cases. You have things like lending club with like peer-to-peer -peer lending. And then you have very large financial institutions that have been around for a long period of time. And so Wellen, Wellen is capital, is a Chicago-based alternative provider of working capital to restaurants, small businesses in retail, manufacturing, healthcare, services, and technology. And they found that they had a big challenge with default rates. They were unpredictable, they had unintentional biases, and they were affecting their underwriting quality. So fortunately, they had a whole bunch of historical data to be able to learn, uh, and they had deep expertise in the markets. So they were able to use data robot to stand up some of these predictive models and quickly leverage their historical data. Now, truth be told earlier, when we had discussed the idea of these five very specific questions, you can organize your data and ask any of those five specific questions. That's how predictive modeling can go across different industries. So they were able to use it, tailor it to their specific business, uh, and then make credit decisions and risk-based pricing better. So there is a uh, link at the bottom there to uh, URL that you can use to go through a good, uh, essential YouTube video that walks you through. So a little bit on this discussion, a couple of the pieces that I walked through here, you can see on this, uh, it's essentially a worksheet that we've been able to put together. Um, and we actually sit down and write it out with our customers. If you're interested in getting a copy of this worksheet, I can send it to you in PDF. Feel free to reach out, but it allows us to go through and as I said before, take all the different examples or use cases. And every time we have a staff meeting or a team meeting where we have a particular problem, go through that problem and see if we can frame a predictive question against it. One of the uh, observations Sean and I had as we were preparing for this is about how in these COVID and hopefully post COVID days, IT agility and resilience is super important. So one of the themes that I hear from a lot of our customers uh, in capital markets and consumer banking, et cetera, is 
that they need not just the technology, but very sort of responsive partners, flexibility to respond to volatile markets or changing conditions, and data that's clean, available, and ready to de guide decisions. Uh, and this is the bread and butter of InterSystems now. Uh, we have a platform called InterSystems Iris. It is a platform that's used for both transactional and analytic workloads. Some analysts call this translytical uh, or HTAP, hybrid, hybrid transactional analytic. So we shine in these areas across different data models. We have a built-in system for interoperability because data is never all in one place. And a lot of facilities for improving data, analyzing, making it lined up. And the last but not least, uh, built-in facilities to connect with machine learning, such as data robot. If you'd like to know more, uh, about that, I've left my contact coordinates. Uh, so feel free to reach out to either Sean or Jeff. And uh, we're looking forward to any questions or any way we can help you in your practical journey to machine learning. Thank you.